We all know that opera actually began in Florence, but for today, we're going to start with Venice, La Fenice, which means the Phoenix, very appropriately, because this beautiful opera house actually burned down several times. The first time was in 1774. Uh, and just to put things in perspective, which I like to do in this class, what happened in 1776? Oh. Oh. Revolution. Mm -hmm. revolution. And in France, the revolution was going on and, and, probably, and still is, in fact. <laughs> it took them about six years to rebuild it, and they renamed it. It had been called the San Benedetto, which means blessed, of course. And they renamed it La Fenice because it rose from the flames. Then, in 1836, it burned down again. And again, it rose from the flames. And unfortunately, in 1996, some of you may remember that uh, some electricians started a fire out of vengeance because they didn't get paid. Here, Peter Gell thinks he has trouble. <laughs> and they burned the theater down, and they rebuilt it, and it reopened in 2004. So you can go in now, and they have tours of, of La Fenice. You can go in. Uh, which I did do and sat in the, the royal box, you know, is always the first tier of boxes, the one in front is always the royal box. The big thing in those days wasn't to sit down in the orchestra like it is now to sit in the third, third row center. Um, so we get, I sat in the royal box, a rehearsal of Don Giovanni going on, so I just stayed and watched it. It was terrific. <laughs> it was very interesting and they let you do that, which is very rare. I'm sure they don't do that at the Met. Today is our day to look at opera houses, and we will hear some of the music that began in those opera houses, so it's appropriate that we start in Italy, and we're going to start with La Fenice, and without um, interrupting, it will go into the first aria that really started the career of Giuseppe Verdi, which was Va Pensiero. I hope you all feel this way during the new year. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> We're off and running. <laughs>
Yes. Virtually, <clears throat> virtually all of the Del Canto composers premiered operas at La Fenice. I'm sure how many of you have been to Venice? I think everybody goes, first place you go, you know, and it's hard to find your way out once you're there. Um, uh, Donizetti wrote for La Fenice, uh, Bellini, Rossini, and uh, Verdi was one, and the premiere of Rigoletto took place in 1851, which is really interesting to think that it took place four years after Tannhäuser, which we just saw. Isn't that extraordinary? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to play everybody's favorite, Don Le Mobile, mm -hmm. which I played the last class so much. Verdi didn't allow it to be played until the performance because he knew very well that every organ grinder on the street would be playing it the next day if they once heard the melody. This is another melody which is famous from Rigoletto. And Jason just had a wonderful comment that Pavarotti's voice sounded like sunshine. Isn't that great? Um, this is sung by Pavarotti, and it's the first act aria which shows the philandering of the Duke. The Duke um, is flirting with a courtier's wife right in front of the courtier's nose. The lady with whom he is flirting, the Countess, um, is very pale. It was very important to ladies to be very pale in those days, unlike today. And, and they wore makeup to make themselves look paler. The makeup, unfortunately, contained mercury, and it destroyed their complexions and, of course, poisoned their whole system. So as you look at this beautiful woman, you might think about that. Here is Luciano Pavarotti at La Fenice singing Questo o Quella. Questo quella per me pari sono a cantare tre d'intorno, d'intorno mi vedo, del mio cuore l'impero non c'è la veglia dura che ad altra beltà, la costoro avvenenza e paldono, di che il fato rinfiora la vita, so di questa mi torna gradita forse un'altra, forse un'altra, Domanlo sarà un'altra, forse un'altra, domanlo sarà. La costanza tiranna del cuore detestiamo quel morbo, quel morbo crudele. So chi vuole si servi per l'enna parno, no, se non ben libertà. De mariti il geloso furore, de diamanti le sparie e perigo. Anco d'argo, i cento più di sfido, se mi punge, se mi punge, una qualche beltà. Se mi punge, una qualche beltà. Yes, it really, really was the best, wasn't it? And now we're going to travel south to Naples. Napoli, which is the home of the San Carlo Opera Company, one of the most historic in all the world. It was run during the first half of the 19th century by a man, something of a scout, Barbaia. He hired some of the most important composers of our time, Rossini, Donizetti, and this opera house, we're going to see three pictures of it. It may not be the most beautiful to you, but it is certainly one of the most important historically. All artists seem to love the weeping willow, and so I thought today we would have three versions of a willow song. One is modern, one is the famous one from Otello by Giuseppe Verdi, but the next number that we'd like to play was premiered at the Opera House of San Carlo, and it is by Gioacchino Rossini. It is his version of Otello, which interestingly enough, the great singer Virginia Zeani preferred to the Verdi, she sang them both. This is Joyce Di Donato singing part of the Willow Song by Rossini, Otello.
Isn't it beautiful? Mm -hmm. You look forward to hearing yeah. more of it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Salute. And we're going to hear that in the next clip, but first I want to take you on a tour of La Scala di Milano, mm -hmm. one of the most famous opera houses in the world. Someone once said to me that there's nothing in Milano worth seeing. They're the same shops that we have in Palm Beach, Gucci, Ferragamo, Hermes. Oh yes, and the Duomo and La Scala. Well, hello. <laughs> I think that might be enough, the Duomo alone is overwhelming. But this is a tour of La Scala. Ogni città ha qualche monumento che le identifica la consistenza soprattutto artistica e storica. Ebbene, non è frequentissimo che sia un teatro a rappresentare una città. Ma è vero, perché il Teatro della Scala è stato, oltre che un teatro nel quale si è sempre eseguito opera e si è fatta musica, è stato un centro sociale della città. C'è questa idea popolare addirittura, quindi manifesta sempre, che quello che succede alla Scala è importante per la città. Se va male la Scala, va male anche la città. E quindi, beh, questo non succede in molti altri teatri. La scala è resa unica al mondo come teatro d'opera per la sua storia, diciamo. Mozart ha rappresentato qui alla scala eh, alcune delle sue primissime opere giovanili e poi tutti i grandi musicisti, appunto, mh, basti pensare a Verdi, eh, Donizetti, Bellini e poi Puccini, sono stati diciamo di casa alla Scala, il, il, il teatro alla Scala è il teatro di Verdi per antonomasia. Io credo che per un interprete qualsiasi si senta l'emozione di um, cantare su quel palcoscenico um, che comunque eh, ha, ha visto eh, tutti fra i maggiori interpreti della storia dell'opera. This is the Willow Song of Verdi, and uh, it's sung by Sonia Yoncheva, a young Russian who is going to be singing the performance that we do see in the Met HD performance. B asked me what, what place it had, what, what it's about, and it's a folk song that Shakespeare simply inserted into his play, and Verdi adapted it, and it has really nothing to do with Otello, but it, it sets the mood. It sets the mood of, of dread and fear and the darkness that has settled over the heart of Desdemon as she sings, this is the will, Canzone di Salice. Some of the other theaters, well, that, that's the famous Arena di Verona, 
And by the way, the tragedy is that they have decided to close it. They are oh, not no. going to be doing performances at Verona anymore. No. There is online is listed this summer, but I think they're not going to do it. They cost too much money. They've gone too far into debt. We know that Italy is the whole, as a country is in terrible debt, but that they close the Arena di Verona. I mean, I, I can't say I've supported it well. I've only been there twice. But still, you know, you, it, it, it's such a fantastic, fantastic thing. And these columns from Aida are m many, many decades old. They were from the original, and they've survived two world wars. Oh, my. Wow. I hope that they start raising money and that they can they can continue with with the performances. You can see how fantastic it was. Just an experience you wow. never forget. And before the performance starts, they give you a little candle when you walk in. Speaking of candles, and uh, before the performance, they ask you to light your candle. All the lights go out all over, and it's pitch black dark except for a few stars and the candles surrounding you in the arena. It's just a <coughs> tremendous experience. Oh and I wanted to do Palermo, so interesting because of The Godfather, which you saw the Cavalleria Rusticana performance in the films of The Godfather, and they rebuilt that opera house uh, for the movie. We'll look at that another day. This is the Teatro Olimpico in Vicenza. Just to give you an idea, a, a small town like Vicenza, but of course every um, every duke, every count, every nobleman at the time, from the 13th 1300s on had to have an opera theater in his in his town, so they they built things in those days. This was built by Palladio, by the way. Yeah. But the name Farnese is very interesting. Of course, it was one of the great families of Italy. But you read from the operatic standpoint in in Tosca, she is in the Palazzo Farnese, is where the offices of Scarpia are, where mm -hmm. Tosca <coughs> narrowly escapes rape. And this is in Parma, where they were famous for throwing vegetables at you if they didn't like you. You ran a terrible risk when you walked on stage, and some of the greatest singers of all time, if they sang a wrong word or a wrong note, they got tomatoes. <laughs> Rotten tomatoes at that. The last one we have is the Baths of Caracalla, uh -huh. which have been restored. How many of you have been to an opera in the Baths of Caracalla? I never have. I'm dying to go. You remember it always, oh, yeah. don't oh, you? God, don't you know, the thing about an opera is it costs a lot now, but you pay that for a dinner out. And how long do you remember that dinner out? And you remember the opera pretty much all your life that you've yeah. seen. So it's well worth it. And it's especially well, but well worth it if you can get these three singing. <laughs>
think he gave you a little feeling of what it's like to be doing that, and what it's like to be backstage and everything. I thought it was very That's nice. Fun, okay. Opera spread, of course, from Italy uh, up into Germany and over into France. And so the next thing that we're going to do is in Vienna. We we'll go to Vienna and the Wiener Staatsoper. Uh, it is to this day. Uh, uh, center of the world for the Austrians. The Austrians are the one country in Europe that I think really lives in the past. <laughs> I can't think of another country where you can buy postcards of the last emperor and empress. <laughs> and it is very popular. <laughs> Everyone buys them. And if you go to Salzburg, the gas station attendants have to ask you what you think of the new rose and cavalier. And it, it lives by music. It, it really lives by music. It's something to talk about and think about, and they breathe and eat it. Um, and this is a, a lovely clip about the Vienna Staatsoper. Every year on New Year's Eve, they still have the debutantes making their bow. They roll the seats back and they do it actually right in the Vienna <coughs> Opera House. And it's, it's something, it's a pageant that's worth seeing. It's a tradition that is, uh, we used to have an opera debutante ball here in Palm Beach, but no more. So that's gone by the wayside, but it's too bad to see it go. And of course, the last person to let any tradition go are the Austrians and the Viennese. Two factoids about the Vienna Opera. The architect, once it was built and everyone was celebrating it, he realized that he had designed the only opera house in the world that was on ground level. All the others, you had to climb steps to get into it. And he committed suicide. Oh, 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 oh. If you go there and you stay on that side, on the Opera House side of the Bristol or the Sacher Hotel, uh, the Bristol has much better Sacher torta, by the way, than the Sacher does. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you go out on your balcony, yes. If you go out on your balcony at night, they they have an enormous screen the size of this room, and they and they broadcast the performance inside, so you can sit in comfort in your hotel room and see the opera across the street. <laughs> and you will see sometimes pouring down rain, and people are sitting there under umbrellas looking Watch at it. They love it so much. And you can buy tickets very cheaply, at least last yeah. minute, actually. Yeah. It's expensive to sit down and down. But you, every opera house in Europe, and this cannot be repeated enough, obviously, uh, you are close to the stage. No matter how high you go, you can see the stage. You have sight lines, which are going to be explained <coughs> in a later clip when we get to Bayreuth. But first, I thought, I, I went to school in Salzburg. I love Salzburg so much. And... Um, 
unfortunately, the Festspiel House, the festival theater, is really ugly. It's just a big brown stage and building. The acoustics are wonderful because it's, um, it's also built wide. Instead of going way up, they built wide, so you can sit on either side and still be close to the stage. But it isn't beautiful, I think, when they have a, a clip of it. But something that you only can see in Salzburg, because they love music so much, and is the Salzburg Marionette Theater, Marionette Theater. Has anyone seen it? No. Isn't it something? I mean, when I say puppets, you think, Wah. you know, I mean, who wants a puppet show? You think Punch and Judy or something, but it is so charming, and you will, I decided that I would show you this because for me it's the essence of Salzburg and of Austria, that childlike sort of attitude towards it. It's just very charming. So here is the stars of the Salzburg and Marionettentheater. Eine kleine magische Welt in einer Stadt der ganz großen Kultur. Salzburg mit ihrer langen Geschichte, den eindrucksvollen Gebäuden und ihren großen Musikern ist sie Anziehungspunkt für Touristen aus aller Welt. Mozart, die berühmte Getreidegasse, die Salzburger Festspiele und vieles mehr haben die Stadt zu einem beliebten Reiseziel gemacht. Beim Hintereingang des berühmten Landestheaters versteckt sich ein genau 100 Jahre altes Geheimnis mit mehr als 450 kleinen Bewohnern. Kleine Bewohner, die große und kleine gleichermaßen begeistern. Wir sprechen vom Salzburger Marionettentheater, das 1913 von Anton Eicher gegründet wurde. Die Intention von Anton Eicher war für seine Kinder ein Puppentheater zu schnitzen und wie das so ist, hat irgendjemand dann gesagt, warum geht man damit nicht an die Öffentlichkeit und das war der Beginn 1913. Offensichtlich eine gute Idee, denn heute faszinieren die Puppen groß und vor allem klein. Die eingängigen Melodien bleiben bei den Kindern hängen, wie hier Prokofjews Peter und der Wolf. An langen Fäden hängen 450 Puppen gut verstaut im Herzen des Theaters und sie warten geduldig auf ihren Auftritt. Die Puppenspieler hauchen den Marionetten Leben ein. Dazu ist viel Übung notwendig, aber noch viel mehr Gefühl. Schon ist der Schwanz in der Schlinge und Peter zieht fest zu. An einer Aufführung sind mindestens fünf Puppenspieler beteiligt. Die Puppenspieler sind ein eingespieltes Team, sowohl auf der Bühne als auch in der Werkstatt. Von der Fertigung bis zur Aufführung haben nur sie die Puppen in der Hand. Mühevoll und mit Liebe zum Detail fertigen sie die Puppen in Handarbeit. Immer unter den Augen des gestrengen Regisseurs, der ganz genau weiß, was er will. Es ist so ein bisschen, dass man so den letzten den letzten Schliff sich selbst vorbehält. Das ist sicherlich auch ein Stück Eitelkeit, würde ich sagen. Die Werkstatt ist das kreative und handwerkliche Herz des Theaters. Hier werden die Puppen entworfen und gebaut und zwischen den Arbeitsschritten immer wieder ausprobiert. Schließlich müssen die Puppen eine Menge an Bewegungen beherrschen. Beide Füße. Spielen braucht viel Übung. Jede Puppe hat ihre eigenen Anforderungen und manchmal braucht für eine Marionette sogar mehrere Puppenspieler. Bei so viel Übung kommt es auch mal zu kleineren Verletzungen. Also wenn eine Puppe erkrankt, 
wird sie hier repariert. Die Puppenklinik ist immer gut besucht, denn täglich haben die Marionetten mindestens eine Aufführung und sie touren in der ganzen Welt. Mozarts Zauberflöte oder Prokofjews Peter und der Wolf sind gut besuchte Lieblingsstücke. Mit The Sound of Music zieht das Theater vor allem ausländische Touristen an, die in der Mozartstadt nach den Geheimtipps suchen. Amazing. Es ist wirklich beeindruckend, wie sie das machen. Man glaubt gar nicht, dass das Puppen sind da vor dir auf der Bühne. Oh, ich liebe es. Wir haben schon so viel davon gehört und heute endlich selbst erlebt. Das Marionettentheater Salzburg. Ein echter Geheimtipp seit 100 Jahren. Richard Strauss was a most a Bavarian composer. He was born somewhat in North Germany, but he, he lived and worked in, in Vienna and in München, which at that time was Bavaria. And I, had, I couldn't let it go without playing one of my very favorite pieces in the whole world, and this was done at the Salzburger Festspielhaus, the, the festival house, uh, with uh, Elisabeth Schwarzkopf makes a brief appearance at the end. But this is the duet from Rosen Cavalier, where Octavian and Sophie pledge their love um, after his affair with the Marshalline has ended. And the costumes are so typical of Austria and of that period, of course.
think we all love that mellow, rich tone, but sometimes to hear that little silvery tone, I, my late husband used to love that. He said it was like raspberry jam for the ears. <laughs> I thought it was so, it was so charming. So we go now to a little bit more melodramatic plays. Uh, Richard Wagner finally got his dream when he persuaded the, the King Ludwig to pay and other people to subscribe to the building of an opera house to his own specifications. The opera house itself is not the most beautiful in the world, but it has magnificent acoustics and it was built uh, for Wagner's operas, and those are the only ones that are ever given there. And once in your life, you really have to to visit Bayreuth. It's just, you have to, okay? And those of you who are in the back, you may not be able to see the subtitles. There, This is in German, but the subtitle, the words are important because it explains to you the theory of Wagner's acoustics and what he has done in Bayreuth in order to make the acoustics he wanted, which was the total sound. He didn't want you to hear the violins coming from here and the drums and whatever. He wanted the total sound. And so this man's going to explain to us the um, Festfield House at Bayreuth. Wir kommen dann unmittelbar aus dem marktgräflichen Opernhaus, dem fürstlichen Theater, hier zu den Vorstellungen eines Theaters und insbesondere eines Zuschauerhauses, was nach demokratischen Gesichtspunkten durch Wagner bestimmt sein sollte. Die amphitheatralische Form, die praktisch Zuschauer gleich Zuschauer macht, ist übernommen worden aus dem griechischen Ideal, von Epidaurus, aber gleichzeitig auch von der idealen Vorstellung des griechischen Theatertages. Gut, das war ja im Grunde genommen auch die Urgeburt überhaupt des Festspielgedankens, dass man aus einem speziellen Anlass eigens zu etwas hingeht und sich dem als speziell hingibt. Das sehen Sie auch in der von Wagner bestimmten Gesamtregie des Tages, dass die Aufführungen Nachmittag anfangen, mit langen Pausen, die der Diskussion und der Wiederherstellung ne, des, Fassungs-, des geistigen Fassungsvermögens dienen sollen, sondern auch äh, die, die Länge und die Diskussion, die damit ausgelöst ist, äh, nimmt praktisch eigentlich dann schon so viel Zeit an, dass man am nächsten Tag nur noch für dieses Ereignis da ist und nicht für etwas anderes. Die Buchkastenbühne in Kombination mit dem Amphitheater hat praktisch die Form des Raumes vorausbestimmt. Es ist also hier ein Sektor, der genau in einem Blickwinkelrichtung zur Guckkastenbühne steht. Für diesen Zweck hat er hier diese Scherwände als Einengung, auch als perspektivische äh, Verkürzung, auch eine optische Wirkung anbringen lassen, die, wie wir heute wissen, nicht nur dieses Optische erzeugten, sondern darüber hinaus auch akustisch auf die Kanälen in den Säulen und der Raum, der dahinter ist und die Einfallswinkel von dem Orchester austritt, machen dann die Atmosphäre der eigentlichen Nachhalles wirksam und danach wird ja jeder beurteilt, ne, wie es dann praktisch wirklich um einen herum tönt. Wir befinden uns hier in dem technischen Herd, das heißt in dem Orchesterraum des Bayreuther Festspielhauses. Wagner ging es, wie er sein Haus konzipierte, darum, das Orchester nicht als Barriere, als Graben, zwischen Zuschauer und Bühne zu haben und kam aus der amphitheatralischen Form heraus entwickelt, dazu den Orchesterraum völlig zu versenken, vorne hier mit einem Schalldeckel zu versehen und auch noch in die Bühne hinunter hinein zu verlegen, dass er jene Größe bekam, die für sein Orchester mit 124 Mann im Ring erforderlich 
ist. Das Klangprinzip besteht darin, dass alle weniger stark klingenden Instrumente, wie die Streicher, die ja bei X-Fach sind in jedem Orchester, hier unter dem offenen Teil sitzen, werden alle stärker tönenden Instrumente hier in dem abgedeckten Raum nach unten untergebracht sind. Die Klangwelle geht nun so, die Klangrichtung von einem Instrument geht nach vorne hier in diesen gewölbten Scheideckel hinein, sodass die Klangrichtung nicht konzentrisch um den Dirigenten entsteht, sondern unmittelbar hier in diesen Scheideckel hineingeworfen wird, sich mischt mit den darüber liegenden Streichern und dann hier über den indirekten Weg auf die Bühne gebracht werden und dort sich mit der Zinkstimme vereinen. taken that that barge trip up the Rhine there's a portion of it that's terribly interesting and they take you to this theater at Schwetzingen the miracle to me is that when they began with opera think about it they didn't have electricity they had a limelight in the front they had candles they had eventually gas light and they had scenery that they had to sort of do with winches and flies and heaven knows what. And the joy of this theater is that it's on the Rhine and it opens back and then it opens back and then it has another scenery, then it opens onto the garden and eventually onto the Rhine. So you're sitting in the theater and here's the tremendous depth of the theater which is much more than where you are sitting. It's something really fascinating to see. And then um, Gordon himself had filmed He had gone to Sweden and for, for the purposes of his Grand Tour project had filmed the theater at Drottninghallen in Sweden, which is one, perhaps one of the few of the old theaters that is still in operation in the way that it was back in the day. Um, this is the theater where Ingmar Bergman wanted to film his magic flute, but they wouldn't let him because the machinery was too delicate and he was afraid that he would damage something, so he built another one for the movie, which can be done, as we'll see again later today. But this is how they work some of the machinery at the Drottningholm Court Theater in Sweden.
interesting that the stagehands in those days were lucky to get their daily bread as salaries and they were operating all this machinery and pulleys and everything. Now the Met stagehands, what are they getting? They push a button and it all works. It's, I mean, you've seen it in the, in the performances here. Um, now we're going to skip London for the moment and we, we can't do everything and you have all seen the, the Royal Opera House. If not, you can look at My Fair Lady and see the Vegetable Garden and then you can see Covent Garden. And Glyndebourne, of course, in England is one, we'll show it another day, but I wanted to go to Paris now. Um, it, the interesting thing to me and the horror to me is the, the view, we're going to look at the Palais Garnier, which was the old French opera house, uh, which they, thank God, did not tear down when they built the new opera house uh, in the Bastille, which I think they, they should storm the Bastille again and get rid of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a shocker, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Let's see. Let's just look at it and see what you think. We'll start with the Palais Garnier. loved the Italian opera as it was known in those days and this is the theatre that you still can see today at Versailles. In those days they had uh, fetes in the garden where they had opera and they had horse ballets and horses performing dressage and clowns and musical fountains and all kinds of entertainment that went on for days. The opera bled over into the New World, and not only into America, but into South America, and that's some of the most amazing places. I haven't been there, but I understand that you're going through the rainforest, and then suddenly there's an opera house. How did it get there? Um, these are some stills of the Teatro Amazonas in Manaus, Brazil, 2,000 miles up the Amazon. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The one man really <laughs> wanted me to be on the Um He has done several films that are the best I've ever seen together with Klaus Kinski. And this is one of them. It's the most improbable of stories, and only Klaus Kinski could portray the madman so well. Werner Herzog said that 
um, he, he wanted to, he tried to kill him several times, but he wasn't able to do so because he was so crazy. Um, it's the story of how a man named Fitzcarraldo was determined to build an opera house uh, deep in the rainforest and the rubber plantations and so forth. And it, if you haven't seen it, you must. The colors, the acting, everything in it is just stupendous. Klaus Kinski und Claudia Cardinale. Der Film von Werner Herzog. Erleben Sie die Geschichte eines besessenen Träumers, der mitten im tiefsten Urwald des Amazonas von Caruso und Großer Oper träumt und dafür das Unmögliche wagt. Zucker finden konnte. Fitzcarraldo, demnächst in diesem Kino. We're going to go to Argentina and uh, Argentina, as they say, and um, the story there is of the Opera House in Argentina. I think, have any of you been to the Teatro, have you, David's been everywhere, have you, to the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, which is very, very beautiful. I chose to do something unexpected with this because it was the seat of many a speech that was made um, by both Evita Perón and her husband, and uh, I, she's so tied in so closely with the story of Argentina and the story of the Teatro Colón and the there that I thought I would play this, so here we go. On this night of a thousand stars, let me take you to heaven's door, where the music of love's guitars plays forevermore. me you must love me you must love me
comprender que a pesar de estar hoy aquí, soy del pueblo y jamás lo podré olvidar. Debéis creerme, mis lujos son solamente un disfraz, un juego burgués, nada más. Las reglas del ceremonial Tenía que aceptar Debí cambiar Y dejar de vivir en lo gris Siempre tras la ventana Sin lugar bajo el sol Busqué ser libre Solo podré conseguir la fe que queráis compartir. No llores por mi Argentina, mi alma está contigo, mi vida entera te la dedico. Mas no te alejes, te necesito. Jamás poderes. Mentiras dijeron de mí. Mi lugar vuestro es por ustedes luché. Yo solo quiero sentiros muy cerca, poder intentar abrir mi ventana y saber que nunca me vais a olvidar. No llores por mí, Argentina. Necesito ¿Qué más podré decir para convenceros de mi verdad? Si aún quieren dudar, miren mis ojos y vean cómo lloran de amor Gordon deserves a hand for that one. It's a very beautiful thing. It's time to play the music. It's time to light the light. It's time to meet the Muppets on the Muppet Show tonight. It's time to put on makeup. It's time to dress up right. It's time to raise the curtain on the Muppet Show tonight. Why do we always come here? 
I guess we'll never know. It's like a kind of torture to have to watch the show. I'm back to the American West. When you go through the American West on your house, on your horse, uh, you can stop in villages along the way and dust, uh, dusty towns and you will find opera houses. Galveston, for example, has an opera house that's simply called the 1894 Opera House and they still give performances there and they still have spittoons in the corners. And here are a couple of opera theaters that may be on your travels you would like to visit or maybe not. This is the Amargosa Opera House. If you ever get to Death Valley, you may want to stop in there. Wow. 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 Uh -huh. Isn't it extraordinary yes, that opera but, reaches yeah, so yeah, close, that they made the effort yeah, to build these really things? Yeah. <laughs> in Pinos Altos. Another view of Pinos Altos. They still do, actually, you know, fun performances. They would shoot them out and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> this is the adjacent building. The adjacent building is the Buckhorn the saloon. saloon, where if you can't really stand the opera anymore, you can always go and have a stiff drink. <laughs> One of the most interesting of those opera houses is the Tabor Opera House in Leadville. And there is also one built by Horace Tabor in, center, in Central City, which is the Central City Opera Company, which is very much alive and thriving today. Horace Tabor was the Silver King at the time of the silver mining peak in Colorado and California. He married a poor but very beautiful girl whose name was Baby Doe. And the ballad of Baby Doe is the subject of an opera by Douglas Moore with another Willow song. You may see some parallels here with the story of the unsinkable Molly Brown, but Baby Doe, alas, did sink. So here is the Willow song, sung by our very favorite American singer, Beverly Sills. Two stories set in the silver mining state of Colorado at the end of the last century. It is a tragic tale, as was the real one, of a girl who stakes everything on love, taking the wealthy mine owner away from his wife, only to see him die a ruined man, and to die in poverty herself. This song, which is almost an interpolation of that love, is what she is singing by herself in the first scene.
what is amazing to me is that so many of the great stars of Europe did come to America and visit these dilapidated western towns. They say operas only for the rich, but the cowboys came on their horses, they hitched them up, and they went in to applaud. Their favorite was probably Lily Langtree, who was also a favorite of the English king, and one of the most bizarre people of all time, Sarah Bernhard, who loaded her favorite coffin, lined with white satin, onto the train and toured the American West. She slept in the coffin. It may have been preferable to some of the Fleabag hotels that existed at the time. I think that we have seen that the passion for opera, for music, has created the widest variety imaginable of opera houses and theaters and venues around the world. That trend, I'm happy to say, continues. It's even happening in China. You'll see some scenes of China, and then you're going to see part of Giacomo Puccini's magnificent opera, Turandot, actually done in the Forbidden City. So you see that that kind of music, that kind of genius, unites the world.
mondo la pura sposa sarà di chi di sangue regio spieghi tre enigmi che la proporrà Fratia pronta al cimento vinto resta porge alla scure la superba festa Oh, 